Rogers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I'm Michael, and I'm here alone today. Um, it's been a while since we've gotten any content out to you. I suppose that's mostly my fault, but uh, anyway, thought that um, even though I couldn't meet up with Liberty Larry, that this would be, uh, well, that really that we just needed to get some something out to you guys. So I've got a few little things that I wanted to talk about. It's probably be a short cast, but um, I'm sure that we'll make up for it at some point when we get deep into something and our, you know, 45 minute podcast turns into an hour and 15. And, you know, so the, the, the time will be made up to you, I'm sure. Um, I, I think I'm, I want to start with this, uh, what's going on in France, um, because I think it's illustrative of how. Uh, how governments function, and um, and probably back to that point that the the purpose of law enforcement is really to protect the government, not to protect you. Uh, so um, France has had a bunch of uh, protests, and I, uh, in the U.S. we would call them mostly peaceful protests, but the in in France they actually call them riots. Um, about a their uh, global security bill that they've been pushing through their um, their version of Congress, and uh, the the big sticking point in it is this Article Twenty Four that says that um, that uh, people can help be held liable for publishing um, images, which includes video, of course, uh, which is the main thing. Um, in, Publishing images of law enforcement officers in France, um, where the uh, officer can be identified, where their face is visible, and uh, it says specifically with the intention to do harm, which is obviously a pretty subjective thing. Um, and so, the the issue here, of course, is that the the reason that people publish these images. Um, is when the officers are doing harm. The uh, what it, it, it's a the ability to publish this kind of um, video, and really what they're talking about here is the ability to publish what they're trying to limit. I guess uh, the government is trying to limit is the ability to publish video where officers can be identified, where they're engaged in activity. Um, you know. Uh, when they're engaged in police abuse, essentially, uh, when they're um, violent, uh, racist, whatever the term may be, um, but essentially when they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing, because that's when people uh, record police officers and publish it to the um, is to try and create accountability. And of course, the reason to um, prevent the publication of this kind of material is to avoid accountability. And uh, like I said, um, it says, you know, with the intent to do harm, uh, but that's a pretty subjective thing. And of course, the the press is concerned that they will be held liable for publishing information um, if it results in harm. And the government claims that they only mean, you know, if you're if you're calling for action against the the police officer, uh, but yeah, what if you're calling for action like he should be fired? Um, does that count as the intent to do harm? And that's kind of the question here. And I think that that's <laughs> what the interpretation would be by the government in the end. Um, and I, I would like to uh, contrast this with a, a couple of other things in France. Um, first, you may remember, uh, those of you that keep up with, with international news, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Um, actually, I guess it might have even been longer than that. It's hard to tell in COVID times. Like, it all kind of slips together. But the uh, um, there was a, a big to-do in France um, about the publication of images, caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad uh, after the, the death of uh, Samuel Paty, who's a school teacher who showed these images warned his class actually that you know this may offend some people so if you um, you're welcome to leave the room or whatever um, and then um, went over these images of the Prophet Muhammad 
and was later was later killed uh, by some um, I don't know Muslim radicals uh, that had been offended and um, and then there was this there was a lot going on in France about whether he should be able to publish these images or not. And uh, they kept falling down on the side of free expression. That the the French government was um, um, adamant that the people of France should be able to publish these images without concern of um, offending others and and so forth. And I agree with them on that. This is you know a point where they they got it right. Um, my ability to publish what I want does not uh, is not affected by your um, whether you're offended or not. Uh, the there is of course you know a, a question about well it, it's actually it's not even relevant. Um, you know the uh, I, I think that they they fell down on the right side of free expression here, and but I find it interesting that they're perfectly content with. Uh, with offending a, um, a an entire re- religious group. Actually, that's not true either. I mean, you know, there are certainly plenty of people. I mean, there was a lot of call out from Muslims that this was a terrible thing that they attacked this man and um, so on. So it's not, you know, I hate to characterize it as like uh, an entire religion was offended by this. Um, I guess in one way or another, they were either offended by the images or offended by the the murder. Uh, but the point being um, that that the uh, government of France was perfectly content with uh, images being published that would offend um, others that were um, and actually like one of the offend one of the most fundamental um, things about uh, how people identify themselves um, in their religion and the 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 um, principle of free expression was the most important thing, but then when it comes down to uh, publishing images of police abuse, they're opposed to you being able to publish whatever you want. That's an interesting contrast there, that um, that they are perfectly content with um, uh, uh, with uh, um, limiting free expression. Uh, where it has to do with uh, something that could be embarrassing uh, for the government. Yet, um, in any other situation, it, it's one of the most important principles of the the, uh, the French Republic. Um, also, within the same Global Security Bill, uh, Article 22 um, has to do with uh, the government employing drone surveillance with facial recognition um, in, in the public in France. Um, so of course they're talking about it, uh, well, to limit terrorism and, and things like that. But the concern is of course that they would be using it. And France has some kind of protest like every other week. The concern is that they would use this drone surveillance with facial recognition to try and limit, um, these protests, uh, or, I mean, even if they don't try to, I think it probably does automatically because people are concerned like that um, that they'll be held accountable for speaking out against the government because the government can be flying well over their heads and, you know, tracking all of the people or identifying them potentially um, for later. And if that's not a situation where um, they are... Um, Capturing images with the intent to do harm, I can't think of a, a of a better um, a better example. So uh, again, this is one of those situations where it's okay if the government captures your image with the intent potentially of using it against you later, even if you're engaged in peaceful activities uh, that are permitted by the government, presumably. Um, but you're not allowed to do uh, the same to government agents who are engaged in activities that aren't permissible. Uh, interesting, right? Um, so that's, that's topic number one. And like I said, just an example of how the government's really out there to protect itself, um, not to protect you. And then um, I thought we'd move on, since there's a whole lot of talk 
about uh, about vaccines, all these vaccines coming out. Um, the you know we would make a comparison of uh, of two different types of um, I guess consumption. Um, you know, one of which is approved and uh, and or actually potentially mandated, and the other um, is uh, is illegal, uh, prohibited. Um, so let's start first with the vaccines because this is this is something that people should be concerned about. Actually, you know what? I'll come back to that. Um, let's just uh, compare um, drug use and uh, and vaccine requirements. So you have a situation, in both cases, this is about putting a drug in your body. And, um, and both major parties are on the wrong side of part of this, <laughs> right? That um, There's a, a, a real contradiction in their, their ideas. So uh, in the, the Democrat Party, it wants you to be able to consume drugs that you choose uh, without concern for the government, the legalized drugs. Actually, I guess they're only really talking about legalizing marijuana, but we'll we'll take the extreme position that that most libertarians would take and say legalized drugs. And uh, but at the at the same time, um, they are perfectly content with requiring you to get a vaccine. Now. In both cases, you're talking about um, consumption of a drug, and in one case, they're mandating it, and, and in one case, um, they're saying that it's your choice uh, whether you consume it or not, and the government shouldn't have any say either way. Now, of course, the, the correct position, the libertarian position, um, is that the government doesn't get to have any say in what you take into your body one way or the other. They can neither require you to put something in your body nor prevent you from putting something in your body. It's entirely your choice. Um, you know, as, as the left would say, uh, you know, my body, my choice, right? On the right, you have the exact opposite position where um, they uh, believe that it's okay for the government to prohibit you from putting per particular drugs into your body, um, but that it is... Uh, out of bounds for the government to require you to put particular drugs into your body. But again, it's the same principle whether you're talking about um, forcing co consumption or preventing consumption. Uh, the, the, the choice is yours. Um, no government should be able to mandate that I put something specific in, in my body, and no government should be able to prevent me or prohibit me from putting something specific in my body. Um, and so uh, this is just uh, something to bear in mind as, as these vaccines come out. And, and now I'd like to return to the actual vaccine issue um, because I don't think that it's been made very clear to the public, uh, first off, how dangerous this can be uh, because they did rush these vaccines through. Um, there weren't animal trials. Um, they haven't don't have a long enough track record. You see these numbers keep changing. It's because they're, they're actually, you're the test subject, <laughs> essentially, if you're taking the vaccine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, uh, and, you know, there's reason to question all this anyway. And so I'm going to try and point out a few of those reasons to question all this. Um, one, uh, the, I'm pretty sure it was the Pfizer vaccine originally, um, came out and it was, uh, it had a 90% efficacy and they were very excited about that. And then the Russian Sputnik V vaccine came out and they said they had a 92%, 92% efficacy. And then Moderna came out and said that they had a uh, 94.5% efficacy. And then Pfizer came back out and said, oh, wait, um, you know, we've done additional tests and we found that we have a 95% efficacy. And then the, um, the Sputnik V vaccine said, well, it turns out after 42 days, we have better than a 95% efficacy. So you see, these numbers keep changing and if that doesn't give you reason to question, um, the, the truth of all this, then, um, then let me keep going, I guess. Uh, so, like I said, these numbers keep changing because they're they're gathering information as we go. And this isn't to say that, you know, I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't take the vaccine. I just got over saying that nobody should be able to tell you one way or the other. Um, but 
certainly beware of vaccine requirements, uh, and they're probably coming. Um, but uh, these, uh, these numbers, they still don't know how long it'll last because we haven't had it long enough to do any kind of testing. Um, the, uh, I, I think that Pfizer's excuse for why their number jumped up from 90 to 95 uh, was because they had a, a, a dosing error yeah, a dosing error that might be something, uh, you know, a reason to for you to be concerned about them um, sticking you with this thing. The, the, the company that's administering the trials doesn't even know how much they're supposed to give you. Uh, and most um, vaccines are, are um, tested for a very long period of time before they're approved. And frankly, there's no reason to consider this an emergency, but... Um, you can get those those kind of numbers elsewhere, and we've covered them on this podcast certainly before. Okay, so they don't know <clears throat> how long any of these vaccines are going to last, like ha- how long uh, you'll be protected. Um, and, you know, bear in mind that they, uh, like I said, these, these things usually go through trials of, for years. Um, also, this coronavirus is the same class of virus as the common cold. Uh, which they've been trying to figure out a vaccine for for a very long time and have not effectively done. And uh, so it could be that you have to do this every year, um, and it, it could be that it's less effective than they expect, uh, that is in these short-term trials things look promising, in the long term it doesn't work at all. Um, we just don't know. And um, the idea that this is some kind of answer to everything... Well, actually, they're not even making that that claim at this point. Um, They're intent on sticking with the new normal, and I swear the next person that says new normal to me, I might punch in the mouth. Um, We don't want a new normal. We want to get back to normal. Uh, A a new normal is a resignation. If you're accepting the new normal, then, um, then you've given up. And... There's there's no reason to um, a- abandon the lives that we've we've had before. Um, this uh, viruses happen. Um, this is something that there's uh, again I, I've said over and over again. Government can't control. Uh, there's nothing that they can do um, to stop a virus, and the numbers bear that out. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember if it was Tom Woods or Dave Smith that I was listening to that made a very simple argument about this, uh, about the lockdowns, which was this. So if the lockdowns worked the first time, why do we have to do it again? And if the lockdowns didn't work the first time, why do we have to do it again? So whether they worked or they didn't work, there should be no need for, for us to do this again. And, the, of course, the lockdowns are far more damaging. I don't have to really deal with that down here. Um, you know, our, our governor, uh, Mama Kay, um, as motherly as she tries to be, uh, has enough sense to not try and um, imprison everybody in Alabama in their homes because uh, there would be a real problem to deal with then. But... Um, you know, to, to get back to these vaccines, um, just the, the errors that have been made in testing, the short term of this, the fact that they haven't been able to test it else, elsewhere, these are all really strong reasons, I would say, um, to um, at least be skeptical. Like I said, I'm not going to tell you one way or the other whether you should get the vaccine. I'll tell you that I'm not. Um, and then uh, beyond that, the as far as the uh, the requirements for the vaccine, there's a lot of talk now um, about uh, you know something along the lines of a health pass, um, where uh, you'll have an app or a card or whatever it happens to be, an RFID that'll that you can scan or present when you're going in places. Uh, getting on planes, et cetera, et cetera, could be connected to the real ID. Who knows? The point being um, that uh, you'll have this information that you carry around that anybody can check. And I would say, I would warn you that 
if you agree to this, what you have agreed to really is um, giving out your medical history. And while we consider this a very private thing uh, for the most part when you say it that way, uh, it seems like when you're talking about um, you know this health pass kind of idea uh, that people seem very complacent about the idea of giving uh, of making their medical history available to any location essentially that they want to enter. And um, I, I would just warn against that. Um, know that if you agree to these terms, um, whether it's this app or connected to your real ID or anything like that, that um, for a long time people in this country have fought against letting, giving the government access to your medical records, um, although I think that fight's mostly been lost. But, um, you know, what you're doing if you agree with uh, this health pass thing is just giving it to them. Like, and to not just to the government, but to anybody else. So for those of you on the left that, that think the government's the answer to everything and the businesses are the ones to be feared, you're giving your medical history to the businesses. And for those of you on the right that think that the government is the entity most worth um, being afraid of and giving and the one that you would give as little information as possible to, you'd be giving your medical history to the government. So... Um, you know, just just know that this is the kind of thing that's around the corner, and that the fear of this is being used to trick you into giving giving away more and more um, of your history, of your uh, independence, um, of your of your power over your own life. And uh, I, I would hope that the people listening to the show would want to avoid that as as much as possible. There was something that I wanted to say earlier, and I completely lost it, so um, maybe it'll come back to me. Uh, but uh, just, so there's been a few things. Speaking of that fear, um, Liberty Larry told me I should, I should tell the story on the podcast. So I, was, I went to a, uh, a restaurant to pick up some food the other night, and this is in a, like a little strip mall area. It's fairly busy. And it was, uh, I don't know, sometime between 6.30 and 7 o'clock at night. This is a well-lit parking not, parking lot. Uh, there's a bunch of businesses around, a bunch of people in the restaurant and in um, neighboring uh, shops, uh, stores. And uh, so I went in there, and I was, I was waiting for my food, and I was standing in the back. And there was this girl back there, and while I was back there, uh, the police came in and talked to her. And... Um, the police came in and talked to her because uh, apparently on her way in, um, she passed uh, by a car um, that was waiting in the parking lot um, with a like this middle-aged man, um, clean-shaven, soft-collar shirt, uh, and like a Honda with a couple of dogs in the car. And he said to her, uh, looks like somebody's got their eye on you. And... She went in the restaurant and called the police because of this. Now, I I can't even imagine calling the police on this. So I, I talked to uh, a, a girl that I work with um, who's in her mid-20s, and um, I, I tried to lay out the situation as best I could to her um, and asked what she would do. And she said, well, I'd probably... Uh, you know, if I'm close enough to hear him, I wouldn't step towards him, but I, I may say something like, excuse me, or, you know, maybe I just kind of hustle into the restaurant and keep my eye out. I said, but would you call the police? She said, no, I don't. no, why? I said, well, this girl did. <laughs> and I, I can't really understand why. Um, I mean, it seems to me, like I said, the, the, the best answer to this is that you just ignore him continue into the restaurant, uh, you order your food, you maybe leave when you're uh, with so when somebody else is leaving too, so you're walking out at the same time, and you just keep an eye out, like you just pay attention. And um, the police handled it really well, and, and as I was standing back there, the after they talked to her, and they were like, they, you know, verified, like this car right here, um, with the, you know, this guy with a couple of dogs in the car, and uh, and she said yes, and so the policeman's walking past me on his way out. And uh, I overhear him say, he's kind of talking to himself, and um, 
I hear him say, this just seems like a complete misunderstanding. And um, from what I gather, because I th- like I said, I think that they handled it really well. When I left the restaurant, um, the police had brought the guy from the car inside, uh, and the two policemen were standing there while these two people, um, the girl and the guy from the car, were talking. And uh, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but um, the impression that I got essentially was that uh, one of his dogs had reacted to her walking by, and that's what he was talking about when he said... Um, looks like somebody's got their eye on you. It's a completely innocuous comment. Um, and while it may come off as creepy, uh, like it's not like the guy was getting out of his, his car or anything like that. There wasn't anything overtly threatening. And so I was, I was, any respect that I could have had for this girl, I pretty much lost with her calling the police for something like this, uh, which I saw as being completely ridiculous. And I, I know I'm, I'm not a young girl in this society, so I, can't really relate, which is why I asked the girl at work, um, and she wouldn't call the police either. So I, I I was thinking more and more about this, and I thought, can you imagine going through life with a level of fear that would have you call the police for something like that, and uh, and how miserable that that must be, and. I think that it's something that has been partially created by this pandemic panic that we've been made to, you know, propagandize to think that we could be dying almost at any moment, that just just any interaction with a person is dangerous to our lives. And I think that this is a this is a really um, this is having a really adverse effect on a lot of people in a lot of ways. Um, life is a quality, not a quantity. Um, in fact, as another personal story, um, you know, my, my father has been not well for a long time. And I think that a big part of that is that, um, that is because of fear. I think that he became so afraid of dying that he stopped living and, I think that this is an affliction that has affected a tremendous number of people since this pandemic scare started, um, that you've become so afraid of dying that you've stopped living. And, and it's just important, I guess, to remind everybody that, that life is a quality, not a quantity. Um, life is not just about not being dead. Um, and, and I hope that people took advantage of, of the holidays to see friends and family. And I hope that you do so for the next holiday too, um, despite all these orders from these various um, governments about keeping you, keeping you separate. And just one more point, I guess, before I get out of here, um, that there's all these restrictions on, um, on bars and restaurants and uh, family gatherings. And, like you might start to wonder why, or I, I at least started to wonder why these kinds of events particularly have been targeted. Um, these, these locations and these kind of events particularly have been targeted. And I think it's this, that these are places where people mostly speak fairly freely. Um, that if like in the bar, once you've had a drink or two that you might, you know, lower your inhibitions and start saying what you really think about a lot of this stuff. And of course, when you're around family, you're less guarded. Um, it's people that you trust more. And so you tend to talk about, about what you really think of what's going on. And, uh, I think that in a situation like this, where, where we're all being propagandized, um, where the, the point here, uh, is to create a level of fear where you're compliant that in a situation where you're speaking more freely and giving other people reasons to resist is something that the government itself would fear. So I think that this is why these locations and events have been targeted. Um, Also, family has always been dangerous to government, right? Like, who do you hold your greatest loyalty to, your family or your government? Well, um... I would hope uh, that it's your family, and uh, and that's you know that's dangerous to government, um, just like religion, uh, which has also been targeted. Uh, speaking of, um, although I think for a different uh, different reason, um, I, I think that uh, 
that religious leaders can just be very influential. And so if you have religious leaders particularly who want to get their congregations together in a situation like this despite government orders, um, that probably those are the religious leaders that as a government you would be most afraid of influencing their their congregation. So I guess it is kind of the same thing. Um, but uh, anyway, um, I, I think that these uh, these particular things have been targeted because um, it's it's talk in these areas and in these situations that are most likely to lead people um, to questioning more about their government and what's going on and questioning more about the information that they have been given about uh, about the virus and uh, maybe digging in a little deeper and a dissemination of information like what we give out here. And um, so that that's why uh, that they've been targeted is again, you know, back to the to the beginning, um, the government trying to protect itself. And uh, so I guess that's it. Um, like I said, it was a, kind of a short one, but definitely wanted to get some content out to you. I, I don't enjoy doing this alone as much as I enjoy doing um, this with Liberty Larry. It's it's much easier for me when this is a dialogue. But, oh, um, you know what? So I had one other thing, but it doesn't really fit anywhere. And so I'll, I'll just bring it up when it's more relevant, I guess. Um, I'll, I'll transfer that note to another page. And, uh, so we'll be back when, whenever we can get back, um, and, uh, and get you another, get you another podcast, um, at the earliest time that we can. And in the meantime, try and stay free. And, uh, in a week or so, um, we may finally get this right. So, ciao. (laughs) 